you very much. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, just before I get started, I just wanted to ask Mark, I know you're letting people into the webinar currently. Uh, should I hang on uh, a few seconds, just if there are more uh, participants coming online? Uh, Graham, there's no one waiting at the moment. Okay, I just saw the numbers uh, increasing, okay. So I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone to our third uh, COVID-19 ECHO webinar uh, on behalf of the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town. My name is Graham Mankis. I'm the second chair of medicine at UCT. Um, our format for this afternoon is we're going to start off with a brief uh, overview and update on the epidemic in the Western Cape uh, province of South Africa, and then go on to our main talk, uh, which will focus on the potential role of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Um, and then we're hoping uh, towards the end of the webinar to have around 20 minutes uh, for a panel discussion uh, where the uh, panel of four members uh, who I'll introduce later will be, have an opportunity to ask questions uh, of, of uh, the speakers, as well as uh, to make a few points around the, the topics that we've discussed. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Professor Marianne Davies. Marianne is based at the UCT School of Public Health uh, and the Western Cape Department of Health, and she's going to give us an, an update. She spoke last week, but give us updated data on the surveillance of COVID-19 in the Western Cape. So thanks very much, Marianne. Um, thanks very much. I'll just wait for the slides to come up, which I think Mark's putting up now. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to be part of this fantastic endeavor. And we're hoping that as appropriate, either Andrew or I, or someone else from the Department of Health can provide a regular update on behalf of our very rapidly growing outbreak response team who are responsible for both our case and contact tracing as well as for our surveillance efforts. You can move to the next slide. So where are we at the moment in the Western Cape? You may remember, for those of you that um, listened to Professor Karim's talk uh, just over a week ago on Sunday night, that he talked about three waves of the epidemic, which are illustrated in the picture on the left. He talked about the imported epidemic in blue, the import associated epidemic in red, and then our community transmission in green. And if you look at the figure on the right hand side, you will see that that's exactly what we've seen in the Western Cape. We have uh, very nicely our imported epidemic in blue, our associated epidemic in red, and we like to believe that our contact tracing efforts have been um, responsible for really keeping that import associated epidemic relatively small. Uh, we, to date, have managed to reach uh, in the metro 80% of nearly three and a half, uh, sorry, over 4,000 of the contacts of our cases. But rather concerningly, you can see on the right hand side in green, the growing number of cases in community transmissions. And if you look up to the figure on the top right, comparing with the rest of South Africa, the Western Cape is the blue line. And you'll see that if anything, we look steeper than any of the other provinces. We think one of the reasons for this is because we've been quite proactive in terms of screening and testing, particularly where we have found clusters. And the particular high numbers that we've seen in recent days in the Western Cape are largely due to uh, workplace clusters, as well as clusters in, in some retirement facilities where we have done very active testing and identified a very high proportion of people who are positive. These, uh, mostly for the workplace clusters, are young, healthy people who are going to work. And so when I come to the hospitalizations, you'll actually see that there's been a slight uh, drop in our new admissions because these young, healthy people are generally doing quite well. Uh, but of course, those people, although they may be in a cluster in the workplace, they are scattered throughout the Western Cape in terms of where they live. And so we are expecting that we will start to see really even more rapid widespread community transmission. Uh, this really speaks to those bushfires that uh, Professor Karim spoke about, these clusters that are igniting sparks um, across the metro as well as, uh, as well as the province. If you can move to the next slide. 
So um, this is really just an update from last week. We continue to have a very high number of public sector tests, about 3,000 tests being done per week, as you can see in the figure on the left-hand side. And as we expect with expansion of testing, a slightly lower positivity rate among all those tests. And then our community screening and testing efforts, which is uh, not so much cluster driven, but going into vulnerable communities where we do know of some cases uh, continues to ramp up. We've now screened about 80,000 people, um, about uh, seven or eight percent in the metro were symptomatic and tested, a much lower percentage in rural. And of those tested, about five percent are coming back positive. You can move to the next slide. Um, this is an update on hospitalizations. Essentially, the proportions overall, if you look at the donut on the right hand side, have not changed much, a slightly lower proportion in ICU. On the bottom left graph, you can see the daily admissions um, overall in yellow to general wards in gray and to ICUs in orange, and then the deaths, and those are by date of admission, not by date of death, um, are in red at the bottom. Uh, so this is only talking about uh, deaths in hospital or at least presenting to an emergency facility. We now have 22 deaths in the province in total, as announced uh, this afternoon. And uh, looking at our overall in-hospital mortality, it's just under 20%, but it's about, about double from ICU and about half that for those admitted to the general wards. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, a growing number of public sector admissions as we presented last week. We have seen a, a slight dip in our new admissions. If you look at the, the um, right-hand side of, of the graph of new admissions. Um, and we think that's probably because at the moment the clusters are largely in that young, healthy workforce that I talked about. So who are these people who are being admitted and who are dying? We can move to the next slide to get a little bit of a better sense of that. Um, and this is just looking at the age distribution of cases um, by uh, all cases on the left and then moving to hospitalization, ICU and death. And you can see that essentially, um, as we're looking at more severe illness, our younger age group is, is crowded out. And that's certainly uh, the bulk of our ICU and admissions and deaths are in our older age group. And then the table on the right hand side just shows you the mortality rates uh, across all our cases um, by age group. This is very crude, there are no confidence intervals, there's nothing fancy here, uh, but, but starts to give you a sense of what's going on in terms of our epidemic. And then uh, the last slide, um, this is just looking at comorbidities in patients in the deaths. This was uh, when we had 16 deaths, I haven't updated it to account for the latest deaths, but essentially um, if you look at the previous TB and the HIV, that's one, one of our deaths each, because I'm sure this group is interested to know that, but um, a high proportion of patients with comorbidities, 70% of the deaths have at least one comorbidity, and um, over 30% have multiple comorbidities. And uh, I'll end there and just say thank you um, to, to the big group of people that makes this possible, and not to forget the patients, the contacts, and the caregivers, and all of the health workers, many of whom I know are listening. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mary Ann. It's, it's really useful to get those um, real-time updates and, and to see the data that's um, being put together at the provincial level to inform our response uh, to the epidemic. And we look forward to hearing the updates going forward from you and Andrew um, over the next uh, weeks to months. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor David Bulwer. Um, David is a research collaborator of mine uh, for several years now, who's based um, at the University of Minnesota in the US. Uh, he's a, a professor of medicine and a physician scientist uh, who's established a really successful programs of research, both in Uganda and South Africa, uh, particularly around cryptococcal meningitis, but more recently around tuberculous meningitis. Um, and when the uh, COVID-19 epidemic hit the US, uh, David quickly changed his research focus uh, for the time being to COVID-19 and uh, very rapidly got 
a trial of hydroxychloroquine off the ground uh, to look at its role in the prevention of COVID-19 in healthcare workers working uh, in, in hospitals and clinics across the US and has also now started a, a treatment trial. Um, so the, the, in the talk today, David's really gonna address uh, some of the issues uh, around the evidence that we have uh, currently for uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and some of the gaps in the evidence, um, and then speak to us about the trials that he's undertaking in the US. Um, so I'm very grateful to David uh, for giving up the time. I know he's got a hectic schedule at the moment running these trials that are really being run at multiple sites across the US but I think he'll have some very uh, valuable insights on this uh, topic to share with us. So over to you, David, thanks very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invite, Graham, and, and others uh, to speak today. And um, hopefully this will be uh, informative. Um, so I'm just gonna review briefly uh, the data uh, on hydroxychloroquine, what actual data there is. It's not very good data, but I'm gonna review it. Uh, and then talk a little about our trials that we're doing and um, lastly, sort of finish up, particularly about healthcare workers and uh, what we're doing there and what, what data uh, there is. And so, oops. Oh, okay. My clicking skills are a little bit off here. So uh, the reported uh, sort of daily uh, cases in the U.S., we've sort of plateaued around uh, 30,000 cases just to kind of review the situation. Um, and we basically started working sort of early uh, in the curve when the, when the curve sort of started to rise kind of right at that seven-day average uh, point. Uh, and we were um, a little bit interested in that. And if I can go forward. And so in the US, just as likely in uh, South Africa, the distribution is very unequal. Uh, urban areas uh, are much more pr uh, predominantly affected than rural areas. And so within the, uh, even within that, that this doesn't sort of account for population. And so if you look at sort of per capita distribution, uh, there's areas that are you know, very heavily affected uh, and it's not even, um, you know, excluding sort of the New York area, um, as you look across the U.S., it's very sort of sporadic, and, and uh, there's very uh, clusters of outbreaks um, that have that have happened. And when you look at the new cases per capita, even that that's changed. And so even though New York was hurt, hit early on um, with aggressive um, uh, measures there for control, that the number of new cases is is then sort of shifted and is more sporadic, which is a much more difficult challenge. So what to do about what to do about it? And so um, we thought to look at, at chloroquine uh, and, and or hydroxychloroquine. And, and so when we first uh, looked at this, uh, we realized that basic chloroquine, there isn't a supply of chloroquine in the U.S. And so we said, well, let's, let's look at hydroxychloroquine because there's actually six or seven different manufacturers. It's cheap. It's available. And as many of you know that um, chloroquine has some weird um, antiviral properties that have been shown in vitro with multiple viruses. Um, and so one of my first actual studies as an ID fellow was looking at chloroquine and its anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, in HIV, which we published back in 2006. So I was kind of aware that it had some in vitro um, um, activity, but oftentimes, what does that actually mean for clinical activity? And so going back um, uh, to this uh, data, if I can advance this slide somehow, okay. that um, uh, there basically was in vitro data that was looked at with the original SARS virus in 2005, uh, and so this is in uh, Vero cell lines. And so a Vero cell line is an African green monkey kidney cell line. And so it's a standard sort of antiviral, um, you know, uh, culture media that's used for in vitro studies. Uh, but you do have to wonder what does it actually have to do with, with you know, a, a virus that infects the respiratory epithelial cells. And so um, this is the in vitro data. So as you add chloroquine, basically there was uh, uh, an antiviral effect uh, that's thought to do in this, uh, in this article was due to the glycosylation of the ACE2 receptor. And so basically there was decreased uh, uh, binding and, and sort of entry uh, into the cell with the uh, SARS virus. They redid this with MERS virus and MERS enters uh, not via the ACE2 receptor. And so there was no effect in MERS. And then uh, the next slide is uh, with uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus that uh, Yao in uh, China 
uh, basically repeated these experiments also in a vero cell line. And sort of whether you, you sort of gave drug beforehand or, or afterwards, how they define prophylactic was a little bit weird, but basically you could see sort of up top that was sort of 48 hours of drug that they sort of had this EC50 at, at 0.72. And so this is sort of a, a fitted line. And so what is an EC50? Well, it's 50% of the maximal inhibition. And so it's kind of a lab, art, it's an, a lab metric that's used for viral uh, inhibition, but is 60% better than 50% probably, and is 40% better than, than nothing probably. And so it, it, it is sort of a metric, but that's sort of the target that people are working on, of sort of, you know, this 0.7 sort of micromolar concentration uh, and to try to see if there's an effect. And so next slide. Uh, so when you look at any of these in vitro studies, the first thing I often do is, is look and see, can you actually get drug above this target? And so there was a study that came out on ivermectin. Uh, and so when you looked at the actual amount of drug that you would need to reach the, 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 the target, uh, it's, it's way above what you would actually achieve in a human. And so one of the first things we did, we uh, collaborated with some of my uh, pharmacology colleagues and just modeled uh, if you did sort of a malaria style dosing of sort of initial load and then a repeat load, uh, eight hours later, and then um, sort of daily doses over the next couple of days, could you actually get therapeutic levels above this sort of magic um, EC50 concentration? And so, and so we thought we, we could, and within a population sort of uh, parameter, you could, you could rapidly achieve levels that would be, in, in theory, therapeutic. Uh, and so we thought that, uh, you know, five days of dosing would probably be sort of a sweet spot where you'd achieve sort of adequate drug levels uh, you're not exposing people to excess risk, and it has a long half-life um, that's over a week long, and so you'd, you'd have therapeutic levels for at least sort of 10 to 14 days. And so we thought from a, a pre-exposure or sort of a post-exposure prophylaxis that that would be a reasonable regimen. We're using a slightly higher uh, follow-on daily dosing of 600 milligrams uh, versus the standard malaria dosing of 400 milligrams. Uh, but we thought that it's sort of a rapid load and then, uh, then sort of follow-on dosing would be reasonably well tolerated and would be relatively safe because we've used malaria dosing um, for sort of a three-day dosing um, for decades. And so a couple extra days uh, would achieve a little bit extra um, duration of therapy to action. Next slide. Let's see. All right, and so we, we've, we've published this overview. And so if you forget everything that I say today, you can always go to the open forum of, of infectious diseases and pull up this article, which has a, a reasonable uh, table that summarizes all the studies. Uh, we published it one week ago. It's of course already out of date. Um, I think Paul Sachs says that for reviews of uh, COVID, they have the shelf life somewhere between milk and yogurt. So, so they sort of rapidly expire uh, and are out of date, but uh, at least we tried to pull together what data did exist a week ago. Uh, next slide. And so just to run through some of the studies. So in general, I think if you wanna fall asleep for the next 10 minutes, you can kind of just summarize that the data is really bad. Uh, and so that's, that's part, of the, part of the problem. And so just to run through some of these, these slides uh, that, um, uh, so the Chen uh, article, basically they looked at 30 patients that got sort of treated with hydroxychloroquine or standard of care. Basically they didn't see uh, any differences in sort of rates of um, uh, viral sort of um, conversion. Uh, this is sort of not, this is sort of a preprint um, was published. The second was uh, this Gao article that was sort of this interim report that just sort of said we did 100 patients and it was superior, but there wasn't any actual data or statistical analysis in, in, the, in the paper. And so it was really hard to know, like, what is this? This isn't really a research study. So um, they didn't really specify what were the doses they were using with chloroquine, how long they were using it, but they just sort of said it was superior. And this is sort of part of the Chinese uh, treatment guidelines. Uh, all right, next slide. Um, so the, the sort of, I guess the most famous one, which has gotten a lot of attention is um, out of Marseille uh, that was sort of, um, I guess, rapidly published and, and got a lot of press report, press. And so this was this non-randomized, non-blinded, open-label trial that was done where they had um, basically about 40 patients. So 20, 26 of them got, um, uh, hydroxychloroquine, another six of them got concomitant uh, azithromycin, uh, 16 of them who didn't sort of meet inclusion criteria were the controls. Uh, and then 
of the people who did badly, there were six people who did badly. One died, three went to the ICU, one um, couldn't tolerate the medicine and withdrew, and, and one was, was lost. Follow-up was on hospital discharge, so maybe they did okay. And so they, they excluded this 23% of people who did badly. And so anytime you do a trial and you get to pick out who does badly and you get to exclude them, then obviously the people that do well, um, do well. And so in this uh, case, basically the people that um, uh, basically did well had, had a faster rate of sort of viral clearance, um, and uh, by sort of a week in the therapy, um, both the hydroxychloroquine and, and the, the small group of six people with azithromycin also did uh, quite well. So it's a small sample size, it's not randomized. Um, what this actually means for clinical outcomes, so if you, if you, you know, reduce vir virus faster, that's probably a good thing, um, but we don't really know what that actually means. For, is there an actual clinical benefit that's associated with that? And so the follow-on that, that he sort of presented um, from, I think, 80 patients now, that, that the, the outcomes are generally pretty good in this population. But once again, without a controlled population, it's really hard to, to know what to make of this. And so in this um, study, they also sort of used 600 milligrams a day. Uh, they were splitting the dose, um, which, uh, which one can do, and that basically increases the, the GI tolerability of it. So, uh, so we'll go to the next slide here. And so another... Um, uh, actually, a reasonable uh, study was, uh, was presented by, uh, was published by uh, Chen. Uh, this was actually a randomized trial. So there were 62 patients who were randomized. They got standard of care or the hydroxychloroquine. They got for five days, slightly lower dose of 400 milligrams a day. And they sort of, they had a bunch of endpoints and, and most of them were, were not significant. But the one that was, was sort of this time to clinical recovery, um, which was sort of better in the hydroxychloroquine group. And so it's, sort of a subjective, like, did you improve moderately, significantly, you know, or, or completely? Uh, it's a little bit sort of arbitrary, but they did sort of sneak out a p-value of less than 0.05. Once again, you know, pretty small sample size, and this seems, you know, this is kind of a, um, a slightly weaker endpoint, I would say, but, um, and this is yet to be peer-reviewed that I'm aware of, or as of last week. Um, but a hint, hey, maybe this might be beneficial, who knows. And then, um, Another follow-on uh, French study uh, out of Paris, uh, they looked at 11 hospitalized patients with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, um, doing uh, sort of a, a similar dose in 600 milligrams a day uh, with sort of a standard sort of azithromycin sort of treatment of 500 milligram first dose and then 250 milligram on, uh, ongoing dose for five days. And so within this basically, um, you know, there was, there was a, one of the, the persons had problems with QT pro prolongation, one of them died, a couple of them went to the ICU, um, and basically trying to replicate what was found in Marseille, that 80% of people were still um, positive uh, on their nasopharyngeal swabs at day sort of five to six, which would sort of go against, you know, the, the observation in Marseille that uh, people uh, were clearing virus faster. So once again, this is a um, small sample size, it's an open label prospective study, but the, the concept of faster viral clearance, at least in this population, was not replicated. And then the next one, next one is this uh, preprint that just came out yesterday. And so this is in the news this morning, and some of you may have seen it. Um, and so this was, uh, has been submitted for publication, and it's a preprint that's on a server uh, for this. And um, uh, it's basically a retrospective an, an, uh, analysis of sort of all sort of U.S. Veterans Affairs um, hospitals patients. And so all the, 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 the veterans hospitals are linked together with an uh, electronic database. And so they looked at people who had a known uh, PCR confirmed diagnosis of, of um, uh, COVID. And they basically looked at did they use hydroxychloroquine during their hospitalization. And so basically they had th the 368, so 97 of them had hydroxychloroquine, another 113 of them had uh, azithromycin added on top of that, and 158 did not. And so what they reported, which has gotten a lot of news, is that hydroxychloroquine was associated with an increased risk of death. And so that was basically 28% with hydroxychloroquine, 22% with, with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, 11% without um, hydroxychloroquine. And the rates of mechanical ventilation were, were similar across the groups. And so this is a retrospective analysis. And so when you look at the odds ratio, it's, it, it is, there's a statistical association there, but it's not, a, it's not a trial, it's just sort of what, you know, what the physicians are doing. And so you know, with retrospective um, you know, treatments, there's you know, potentially confounding by indication where you know, the people who weren't very sick, they could be like, eh, let's just observe them, they don't really need anything, versus the, the, the patients who are sicker, 
um, you know, the physicians may be wanting to intervene. And so, um, so it's sort of, once again, sort of, I, it's, da it's data, but you have to sort of put it in the, in the right context. And so I, do I, does hydroxychloroquine kill patients? I don't think that's likely the case, but I think, you know, the, you know, the symbol data is really the concept of, um, is there a benefit? And so I think at this point, at least in hospitalized patients, there's not a lot of data that there's any clinical benefit. So what are the risks? And so the, the risks, uh, I don't have this as a slide, but um, in Brazil, there was a, a high-dose chloroquine trial. And so they were using um, 1,200 milligrams of chloroquine base. So that would be like two grams of chloroquine phosphate um, uh, per day. And so that would be sort of double the normal dose for malaria treatment uh, of chloroquine. And they were combining that with azithromycin. And so, yes, they, they had higher mortality in that, that high-dose group. Uh, and they had a lot of uh, QT prolongation because there is sort of a maximal normal dose of chloroquine. And so once you sort of start exceeding these, the normal doses, um, you're going to run into problems. And so there's a reason why there's a max normal dose. And so in that study, which got a lot of attention in the U.S., the uh, chloroquine was, was what did probably likely cause uh, mortality. But, um, you know, so there is sort of a max limit on these medications where if you push the dose, you're going to run into problems. There's also an uncontrolled this observational cohort of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin uh, out of uh, uh, NYU in, in New York City. And so in that uh, cohort, about 30% of people did have some evidence of prolonged uh, QT. Um, and so that was sort of a cumulative risk over time. So over five days, the proportion with, with QT increased over time. So in a hospitalized setting in an ICU or where you're doing continuous EKG monitoring, or at least intermittent monitoring, I think that's, you know, it's still a regimen that could be safely given, um, particularly if you have a um, if, you, if you're not, you don't have a cardiac history or, or other QT prolongation uh, issues, it's something that you can monitor. And if it's a problem, you can stop, you know, particularly as, as a thromycin. But hydroxychloroquine on average increases the QT by about 10 milliseconds, which generally is not a big deal. Um, but if you already have QT prolongation or you already have sort of cardiac arrhythmias and things like that, then it, it certainly could be. Um, when you add azithromycin on top of that, then that, that adds another about 15 milliseconds on average. Um, and so that is, um, then you're sort of getting to you know, a 30 millisecond sort of change is, is sort of a, certainly a clinically relevant uh, change for some people. Okay, so going onward. So what does all this data mean? Well, I don't know what it means, um, but um, oops, we're, we are now out of this, but there's more data and there's more stuff. Um, let's see here if I cause some problems here. Um, Okay, so oops, let's go to. Okay, so we took the plunge on March 9th um, as far as um, the clinical research. And so the, the story behind this is we were supposed to go to CROI, like many of you may have as well. And so um, my team, we had sort of four days of uninterrupted, uninterrupted, uninterrupted sort of time where we had nothing scheduled. Uh, and we could basically work on stuff. So we basically started to decide to um, uh, take the plunge. And so this is a, a picture from uh, Jinja in Uganda. I'm in here somewhere. Tina uh, 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 Bichinich is also uh, in here as well. But um, the, uh, oops. Um, and so the, um, so we basically uh, took a plunge to, to basically rapidly develop a clinical trial. And so we started with a prevention trial and the concept of the prevention trial was really to see if we could do sort of a post-exposure a post, uh, post prophylaxis. And so for those who were exposed to a household contact or a healthcare worker who was ex with, exposed without uh, the proper PPE, uh, then could you, um, could you give them hydroxychloroquine as a post-exposure prophylaxis to uh, avoid um, avoid illness. And so the concept was, was basically to use, hey, we've, we've used hydroxychloroquine for malaria treatment. It's safe. It's cheap. It's, um, will it work? And so the, the all, other alternative is to use sort of 14th century uh, technology of quarantine. Uh, and so if someone can advance my slide, I'm having challenges. And so we basically uh, started these two trials. And the next slide as well. And so basically we started this sort of during the virtual CROI, which I didn't attend many of the virtual sessions. Um, and so basically in about a span of eight days, we, we wrote a protocol, we got uh, IRB approval, we got an FDA uh, investigation new drug application. 
um, approved. We built a database. Um, we actually obtained the drug, which was um, which was in supply at that point, and obtained a uh, kind of a matching placebo. It's not a perfect match, but it kind of looks similar. Uh, and basically, by March 17th, so eight days later, we enrolled our first uh, subject in the prevention trial, and um, we realized uh, rapidly that um, by the time do the delay in testing in the U.S., which is a whole mess, that um, a lot of times by the time people were exposed, they got the test result back to know they were exposed to a positive patient, they were already symptomatic. And so we expanded our trial um, basically the next week once we got an IRB revision and FDA revision approved uh, to also include symptomatic people. And so we were looking for people with early symptoms. Once again, early in their illness, can you actually uh, treat these people to prevent, to prevent hospitalization and uh, decrease their symptoms? Uh, next slide. So along the way, other things happened which which were not very helpful. And so um, uh, the President Trump started talking about hydroxychloroquine after FDA uh, approved our IND. And so then he was all over that and was really excited about it, which did not help us. Um, and then um, March 29th, um, FDA issued this emergency authorization for sort of approving hydroxychloroquine use in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 on the basis of basically no data. And then on April 6th, we um, expanded to include a PrEP trial, so a pre-exposure prophylaxis trial, of basically using once or twice weekly sort of malaria-style chemoprophylaxis for, um, for healthcare workers that are high risk. And this is led by one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Radha Rajasingham. And the trial design is, is fairly simple. This is not a great, doesn't come up very well on Zoom. But basically it's an RCT. And so people are randomized, half of them get hydroxychloroquine, half of them get a vitamin placebo, which is non-active. We take the medicine for five days and we basically do some follow-up internet-based surveys. And so the trial is a little bit innovative in that it's an internet-based trial. So we never actually see, see any of these patients. Um, and so they basically, initially they were emailing in and they would sort of get an automated response with a URL to a RedCap survey. Um, now we actually eventually designed a, a website that where people come to the website and then basically auto-enroll, go through screening criteria, um, to sort of, um, you know, simple inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, if they, um, for their risk, we do ask like, where were they tested and, and or who was their exposure? And, and we do collect a little bit of uh, more information such that um, we think it's somewhat reliable. About two thirds of the patients in our prevention trial are healthcare workers uh, and about 30% in the treatment trial are uh, healthcare workers. So we basically look for endpoints of, do they get sick? You know, with symptomatic disease, do they get tested? Do they get hospitalized or do they die? And so fairly sort of simple endpoints. We also ask about side effects of the medicine and, and uh, adherence to the medicine. So next thing. And so with that, um, basically our endpoints are looking at, oops, that was, um, basically lo looking at sort of incidence of disease in the prophylaxis trial and then the, pre the preemptive trial. So we had an ordinal endpoint of it basically, were they just sick and not hospitalized? Were they hospitalized? Were they go to the ICU or, or die? And so what we found out, we were sort of just guessing about this. And so for the post-exposure prophylaxis, we were uh, assuming a 10% incidence of disease based on a really small MMWR article of like 52 um, patients uh, that were on a cruise ship. And so the incidence right now, it tends to be 15%. So that actually works in our favor. So that, that's quite good, good from our perspective. For the preemptive early treatment trial, um, we're getting people in the first four days of their illness, and for that, that's that endpoint totally doesn't work. We only have like four hospitalized patients, um, and that um, uh, so it's like one percent. And so we were going for a ten percent rate of hospitalization. We assumed it was going to be lower than the, the stated twenty percent incidence of hospitalization because it's an internet-based trial, and so people have to be a little bit young and younger and savvier. Healthcare workers are generally healthier than the general population. And so we assume there was gonna be a lower hospitalization rate. And so that totally doesn't work as an endpoint. So what does work as an endpoint is we're looking at sort of, um, we ask every day or every follow-up survey on a visual, a zero to 10 visual analog scale of what's their severity of symptoms. So using our sort of cryptococcal meningitis background, uh, we're gonna basically look at what's the, what's the change in their, their sort of symptom severity over time. And so for those that, in the crypto world, which might be about two people on this, this thing, um, we often look at sort of early fungicidal activity of the rate of sort of clearance of the, the yeast from the CSF as a, as a metric, and that's a continuous metric. Uh, and so you can compare then, so we're going to basically compare what's the rate of symptom change um, over time as sort of a continuous metric. And so our sample size will need for that will be much smaller. 
than an ordinal endpoint. Um, and so hopefully that will actually work in our favor, at least to say like, does this do anything? Um, and so if it doesn't change symptom severities um, over time, it probably is not gonna re reduce hospitalization or death in, in the sicker population. And then our, our we've enrolled um, a little over 875 in our, our, our prophylaxis trial and um, about 350 in total now for our treatment trial. And so of the prevention trial, about 10% are symptomatic on day one. So by the, so they, they enroll and then we, we basically ship the medicines overnight to them anywhere in the US and some sites in Canada. And um, so about 10% by the time they actually receive the medicines on day one are symptomatic. And so those people are sort of being, um, going into the treatment trial uh, and also being sort of separately analyzed for that. And so the numbers are a little bit different um, per analysis, but that's sort of where we're at. And so when we talk about healthcare work, so, so that's sort of the prevention stuff, the healthcare workers infections. And so once we started this, we're like, well, we should probably try to do something about healthcare workers because th th there was sort of shortages of personal protective equipment, the PPE, and um, about sort of about 10% of the US infections were due to healthcare workers. And this is a curve from late March. Um, that you can kind of see that in the darker blue is, is the healthcare workers. And so it's sort of the, the pace sort of mimic things decrease over time in some of the high-risk areas. I think in, in part due to sort of universal screening of patients and just like like assume anyone with a cough or anyone with any sort of illness has COVID until proven otherwise. And so I think the rates of PPE have improved um, quite a bit. Uh, and so, but the more complicated aspect is healthcare workers may be exposed in multiple places. And so from this MMWR that was published um, the, a couple of weeks ago, when they looked at where of the healthcare workers who got sick, where was their potential exposure? And so, um, so people had sort of healthcare, you know, about half, 55% of them were exposed at work at, at, at their healthcare, but then 27% of them were exposed in their household. Another 13% were sort of had community exposures and 5% had sort of multiple potential exposures and they didn't know where they got exposed. And so I think that that's probably very relevant in, in Cape Town as well where you know, some people may be certainly exposed in a, health, in, a, in a work setting, in a hospital or clinic, but others may be exposed in their community or, or their household um, by, other, by other people. And so it becomes a little bit more complicated uh, to try to pr protect uh, healthcare workers. And so, so when you look at the risk to healthcare workers, sort of this, the US CDC um, sort of threshold, you know, if you're sort of in a full PPE outfit, which is just defined as sort of, um, a mask, uh, an eye shield, and sort of gowns and gloves, you have a pretty low risk of less than 1%. Similarly, if you're, you know, more than two meters away um, or sort of less than 10 minutes exposure to a patient, you're thought to be at low risk. Um, a moderate risk is if you lack sort of an eye shield or sort of covering of your eyes, um, and sort of high risk is sort of lack of a face mask or an eye shield. And so when we looked at our data set, so of the 800 or so people from the prevention study, um, there's about five of those 800 people, um, there's 523 that were healthcare workers. And of those about 12% or so have gotten sick. Um, and so when we looked at sort of the risk factors um, for um, this sort of a logistic regression, sort of really quick and dirty, not adjusting for anything fancy. Um, uh, so in a sort of a, let me pull this up. So, um, so basically if you have any PPE on that, that reduces the risk by about a third. Um, and if you sort of are wearing a mask, that's about a 20% protection. A respirator is a little bit more, 40% protection. Um, the eye shield really was not at all sort of associated with, with risk of disease. And, and gown and gloves are also associated with about a one-third sort of reduction in the odds ratio. And so none of those are, are statistically significant, but they're all sort of close-ish. Um, and so, but generally, yeah, yes, things were um, the trend was obviously PPE was a good thing, but the eye shield, we really couldn't really detect any sort of increased risk at all. Um, and so the odds ratio was 0.96 for, for an eye shield. And so of things, so gowns, gloves, you know, masks are probably more important um, in the, in the, in the um, big picture. So the other, the other aspect that really is probably most helpful is decreasing the risk by masking patients. And so a lot of institutions, at least in the U.S. and, and our own institutions, have really gone to um, universal masking, both of healthcare workers as well as of patients. And so any patient that's in sort of a, not, not in their own private room is, um, has a mask on when they're being transported or once they walk in the door. And so that's sort of just trying to decrease the, both the environmental contamination as well as um, uh, sort of direct um, inoculation. So the last thing that we're doing is then this PrEP trial. 
And so we're basically looking, oops, uh, we're looking for healthcare workers nationwide. And so what we're doing is basically, um, so both first responders, so police, fire, um, ambulance type people, as well as sort of um, casualty ward people, um, ICU and sort of people in, in designated uh, COVID units. And so, or sort of aerosol performing procedures. So respiratory therapists, anesthesiologists, um, ear, nose, throat kind of folks. And so we're basically looking at sort of the malaria chemoprophylaxis dosing of uh, using hydroxychloroquine. And when we modeled it, if you did it basically a initial loading dose, sort of two 400 milligram doses, and then twice weekly, you'd sort of achieve levels sort of above this um, magic EC50 um, that works in, once again, Vero cell, sort of African green monkey kidney cell lines. And so whether that has any clinical benefit whatsoever is slightly unclear. And so we're also going to look at once weekly prophylaxis because we certainly know that's safe and has been used for decades. And so, but with twice weekly prophylaxis, we think that you would sort of be above this level. Um, but it, once again, it's really clear what this in vitro work um, actually means for clinical benefit and is it protective. And so I think there's a little, I have some, my own sort of skepticism about this, but it's certainly an available medicine. It's cheap. It's a fairly safe medicine when used at normal doses. Uh, and so we're going to see in um, high-risk healthcare worker populations. So my colleague Radha, she's um, recruited over about 1,200 and about 1,300 people now uh, for this trial. We're going for 3,500 people. Um, it's really an unfunded shoestring budget, but it doesn't cost a whole lot to do for whatever reason. There's also another larger U.S. study that's going to be done. It's a $50 million project. So I'm not sure what we would do with $50 million. We'd, we'd probably maybe have nicer graphs, I guess, for, for my presentation. But um, Ours is about a uh, $150,000 study. Um, so we'll see if we can get an answer um, quicker, faster, and, and much less expensive than um, this $50 million study. For that one, they're doing a much higher dose. So they're looking at, at um, I think it's, I forget, it's 400 milligrams a day. So it's, it's quite a, a more aggressive dosing that you would use for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And so for the people that do have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, they'll be well treated. Um, but you do worry if you're gonna continue this for a long duration, of, um, you're gonna run into some side effects. And so I think that is my last slide. And so um, I think we have about 20 minutes for discussion. Um, oh yeah, that's Tata. So yeah, so we did a um, second last slide. So, so um, we did a, an interim analysis uh, two weeks ago for our prevention trial, our second interim analysis in a few hours this afternoon here. And then on Friday, we'll have an interim analysis for our early treatment trial. And, and based on, um, we'll see what these show, I think, we may be done this week, who knows? So we may show benefit, we may show futility, um, but um, hopefully we'll have an answer fairly quickly. And then the last slide is just to um, realize that obviously there, there are other things besides COVID. Uh, and so near and dear to my heart is cryptococcus. And so just to remind you that obviously you guys know that still HIV patients are out there um, and that, um, you know, just particularly in the Western Cape, um, you know, there's a fairly high crypto uh, antigen prevalence rate among people with low CD4 counts that still exist. And, uh, with sort of the lockdown and shutdown that um, this may create problems uh, with medication adherence and, and lots of aspects that may um, affect HIV programs. And so uh, thanks to, to Graham, one of my longtime collaborators, as well as uh, Nilesh Governor, who we work with uh, in uh, Joburg. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. That was a really uh, fantastic overview of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine really up to date and, and a succinct overview of everything uh, that, that exists in terms of our knowledge, uh, but also really putting it in perspective, um, your critique of, of a lot of the studies and showing the limitations. And, and really remarkable what, what your team has managed to accomplish, getting three uh, clinical trials up and running in, in such a, a rapid response to this epidemic that will hopefully give us uh, some answers within the next few months. Yeah. Um, so we, we'll now go move on to our panel discussion and I want to introduce the, the panel members. So um, the first uh, member is Kirtan Dada. Kirtan is the head of pulmonology at UCT. Uh, then uh, Bridget Hodkinson is the head of rheumatology. Uh, Sean Wasserman is an infectious diseases uh, specialist at UCT. And finally, Ashley Chin, who's a cardiologist uh, with a special interest in electrophysiology of, of the heart, uh, is our fourth panel member. So I'm going to ask uh, Kirtan if, if he wants to make a, a few comments and, and then uh, ask one or two questions of David uh, to, to get the discussion going. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Graeme. And thanks, David. That was a, a great talk. And I echo uh, Graeme's sentiments. Uh, very impressive, um, the rapidity at which you started these trials and recruited so many patients in such a short space of time. It's really impressive. It's a lot of work to get these trials started. 
Um, I have one comment, one quick comment, and then a question. Uh, and I noted you alluded to the viral cell line, which is uh, a monkey kidney cell line. And I also quizzed one of the virologists recently about this. And it turns out that it's much more permissive to infection. Uh, and also it doesn't produce alpha and beta interferons. So you don't get the confounding effect of that uh, in cell culture that you normally would get with a respiratory uh, cell line. And in fact, when using those, uh, the lab I spoke to doesn't get very good results. Uh, regarding the question, uh, it's around the optimal dose of hydroxychloroquine, and you touched on this at several points in your talk. And there are so many different protocols, some using 400 milligrams a day uh, for treatment or proposed treatment, going right up to 1,200 milligrams. And you know that Brazilian study which showed that 1,200 milligrams is associated with a higher proportion of QT prolongation. And of course, as you outlined, it's a balance between antiviral effect and uh, uh, risk of adverse events. Uh, so I just wondered, what's your sense, uh, you know, given all the data you showed us uh, about an optimal dose in COVID-19 infected and uninfected persons? Uh, any suggestions uh, with your experience so far, having recruited these patients and looked at your numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think from a, a tolerability standpoint and safety standpoint, um, about 70% of our patients have no side effects whatsoever. Now, half of them are on a vitamin, so you assume okay, that's probably the vitamin is hopefully well tolerated. It'll be interesting to look once we're unblinded to see how many people had neurologic reactions to the vitamin once they had read the package insert um, on hydroxychloroquine. But but you know, presumably that means you know. So if you assume that you know of that, that means you know, a little over half of the people likely taking hydroxychloroquine had some adverse reactions. The majority of those were sort of stomach upset, sort of GI, you know, blue stool you know, nausea kind of things. And so the rates of actually more serious adverse events of, you know, tinnitus or neurologic things um, was, was quite low as sort of 5%. -ish. And so, so that I think the tolerability is relatively good at the dose we're using the 600 milligrams. It's only for five days. I think if people are sick or they're really nervous about, you know, being exposed, there's certainly some anxiety that people have as well that, that they sort of also noted that was very anxious. Um, that, um, you know, I think that five days of a medicine you can probably tolerate pretty well. If you're going to be on it for three months, that's a different story. Um, and so the question is really, what is the optimal dose? And so that, so, so we know tolerability seems to be okay. If you use a lower dose, it's probably better. If you split the dosing up, we recommend that. So, cause it has a long half-life. So you don't need to take all three tablets at once. Busy healthcare workers may just be like, boom, I need to go to work, you know, take them three at once, uh, upset stomach, stomach for half an hour it's fine. When we look at the rates of discontinuation, it's only about 2% of people that discontinued the, the medicine who started it. There were some people who got nervous and they read the press reports and, oh my gosh, maybe I don't want to start the medicine. But of the people who actually started the medicine, 98% of them actually completed the medicine. So that's good. And then the second um, aspect is what's the right dose? And so, so you know, people are sort of shooting for this 0.72. If you if you go actually back to the graph and, you know, it's a log scale. And so like, is it really 0.72 or, or one, or is it 0.5? Like there's a 95% confidence interval, which isn't really mentioned. And so we wanted to be on the higher end of the dosing just because it didn't, if it didn't work at sort of a high tolerable dose, it wasn't going to work at a lower dose. And so 400 milligrams is probably going to be better tolerated than 600 milligrams is. But at the same time, like if it didn't work at 600 milligrams, we didn't think we could go much higher beyond that. Um, without running into toxicity. And importantly, either our IRB or FDA saying, well, you know, this is like problematic and, and, and then just having a delay where we couldn't actually do the study um, because we're not, we're doing a really an outpatient study. And so we wanted to balance sort of, you know, potential benefit with not causing harm. Thank you. Thanks, David. So, um, Bridget, if I could bring you in and, uh, you know, you've obviously had a lot of experience using uh, these drugs in the treatment of patients with rheumatological conditions and just your views uh, on the use of the drugs and if you've got any questions for David. Good, thanks Graham um, and thanks David. Um, yes, you're correct. Uh, we only have access to chloroquine here in South Africa. Um, hydroxychloroquine hasn't been available for many years hmm. and uh, chloroquine is probably the, the least safe version of chloroquine. And um, I must say, short-term use in low doses as is being presented, um, I, I think we're very unlikely to encounter problems, particularly among um, young healthcare workers who presumably don't have many comorbidities. 
the, the one uh, side effect we do notice with, with chloroquine is um, that it's a, it has a terrible bitter taste and a lot of patients are, are actually don't take their medicine for this reason. And I wonder if you are going to be able to measure adherence. Um, and, and the other thing is healthcare workers are not the most adherent group of medicine takers in the world. And with intermittent dosing, this, this may actually um, be the biggest problem you encounter. So that's my, my biggest concern. And my only other concern is that um, use of antimalarials for um, prophylaxis, um, I, I hope it doesn't interfere with the supply to rheumatological patients of, of, of these vital drugs. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think even in the U.S., we have the concern of, of access to medicines for rheumatologic patients is, is, is a problem. And so my sister actually has rheumatoid arthritis, and so I'm sort of keenly aware, uh, keenly aware of that. And so I think in part, we wanted to do a study to prove it either worked or it didn't work, because there's a lot of people using it. And so there's people just taking it as prophylaxis, and they're using all sorts of weird doses and just like, I'm taking it once a day. And so there's just all sorts of like mass hysteria going on in the U.S. and some of it rightfully so because you see, you know, healthcare workers getting sick that are, you know, relatively young and, and having sort of ICU stays or deaths. And so people are kind of freaked out about it. And so there is a lot of sort of mass hysteria of just taking the medicine, even though it's not proven. It's, 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 and so we wanted to actually try to see if it would work or not. Thanks. Thanks, David. And, and thanks, Bridget, for that question and comment. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ashley, I'm going to bring Ashley Chin. So Ashley, as I said, is a cardiologist with an, an interest in electrophysiology. Um, and Ashley, your, your views on, on the safety of uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, um, particularly given th that these are uh, often ill patients um, with, with a lot of um, you know, severe illness uh, indicators and, and what, what the concerns around QT prolongation in, in that setting. Uh, thank, thanks, Graham. Um, thanks, David, for your uh, very good presentation. Um, yeah, so I, I think there is a, a lot of concern. Um, there's a lot of data now in there, or a lot of concern from the arrhythmia societies and the arrhythmia community about the use of these drugs. Um, there's been some good data now from the Mayo Clinic from Mike Ackerman's group um, that have sort of um, estimated that about 1% of patients who are going to go into these drugs might have a, a QT interval over 500 milliseconds. And as we know, the the 500 millisecond to, uh, cut cutoff is quite a, a, a number where the risk of Tassad starts climbing. And therefore, a lot of the arrhythmia bodies have um, published guidelines and have actually recommended ECG screening for all patients, um, whether it's prophylactic or whether it's also on, on a treatment basis, they should be on, they should at least have a baseline 12 bit ECG to exclude patients um, who have a very long QT interval. So. My question, Dave, is just in regard in your studies, um, I know some of them is pre-treatment and some is prophylaxis. You know, what are your protocols regarding ECG screening or ECG, baseline ECG screening and monitoring? And do you think it's necessary for, for all patients or just a select few? Um, just want to hear your opinion. Yeah, so our protocols, we're, we have a bunch of exclusion criteria. So if you have uh, structural heart disease, ischemic heart disease, um, family or personal history of prolonged QT, if you're on antiarrhythmic medicine. So there's a bunch of basically exclusion criteria. Otherwise, we're not, we're not doing based on EC, ECGs. And so that's, um, and I think going back to the, the tropical medicine experience and the rheumatology experience, I asked rheumatologists and they're like, what's an EKG? Like we, we never get these for our patients that we put on plaquenil for hydroxychloroquine. And, you know, similarly in, in tropical medicine, we, you know, for a short term, you know, treatment, we don't, um, you know, we don't get EKGs before we prescribe chloroquine for malaria. And so I didn't think that was necessary. And, you know, our IRB was okay with that and FDA was okay with that. Um, I think it's different though, if, you know, the certainly chronic use can cause a cardiomyopathy, can cause a, a, a prolonged QT. Um, you know, in one study with chloroquine, I think when people are on it for a median of two and a half years, you know, their, their QT prolonged by 25 milliseconds, which is a significant amount. And so similarly, if you're using a super high dose, if you're combining with azithromycin, uh, there's potential risk. And so FDA did not want us to combine, mentioned specifically not to combine it with, with azithromycin. Um, and so, yeah, as long as you're not using other QT, QT prolonging agents or you don't have a, a baseline cardiac history, you know, we thought it was fairly safe. We haven't had any reports of arrhythmias and death 
um, among our thousand or so patients. David, can I just ask on, on that uh, point, how, how are you screening uh, for potential participants, uh, whether they're on other QT prolonging drugs? Is I mean, we just have a list and asking. Um, so actually for, for, it's interesting. So in Canada, they're very specific on QT prolonging uh, agents. And so they don't want people on methadone and various things. For us, we're actually just looking at um, the primary um, um, sort of cardiac arrhythmia medicines and things like that. Because uh, a short treatment dose, even like within, sorry, so even within like the, the arrhythmia studies uh, with, um, you know, when they looked at uh, azithromycin plus the uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in the NYU ICU, that it was sort of a cumulative risk over, day, over you know, the five days of azithromycin. And so on day one, even with that combination, people didn't really have a, a ele elevation of their QT, but it was sort of a cumulative toxicity mm -hmm. um, effect. Thanks. Right, thanks. So, um, Sean, uh, do you have a question either for Marianne or, or David? Uh, yeah. Um, hi, David. Uh, thanks for a really great talk. Um, it's a, a really brilliant overview, and, re and it's, it's quite phenomenal how you've managed to get these trials online so rapidly. Um, we've actually also developed a clinical trial um, for coronavirus in HIV-infected patients uh, with mild disease, so patients... Mm -hmm who get tested and diagnosed um, in, in testing centers and then get managed as outpatients. And we're randomizing them to hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine um, versus nothing. I mean, it's difficult to get hold of placebo, um, yeah. which is standard of care. Um, so the, our, our, it's, it's a very pragmatic trial, no, no visits. Uh, and I want to ask you in a minute about conducting clinical trials in the time of COVID. Um, the dosing regimen that we've chosen for uh, hydroxychloroquine is uh, quite a lot higher than yours based on modeling from the Oxford group. Um, so yeah, yeah. we're giving hydroxychloroquine 800 twice daily as a loading dose mm -hmm. uh, for one day and then um, 400 twice daily for seven days. And I mean, the models suggest that at this dose, you can achieve a rapid therapeutic concentration you know, because we want to achieve that early for a short term. Yep duration it stays above this ic50 for about 18 days where you know we'd expect the viral load to disappear in most patients um, and it's actually double the ic50 for about 10 days um, because we're using these higher doses we are doing qt screening for eligibility which complicates mm -hmm. things a lot yeah um, and, and so it was very interesting to hear your approach um, so just following on from that i wanted to ask you about a general question about performing clinical trials in the time of coronavirus. I mean, you've had to change the, the way that you do things completely, and so have we. I mean, so you've implemented this completely kind of hands-free um, uh, recruitment system, uh, consent system, collecting data. Um, do you think, number one, that kind of biases the kinds of participants that you're able to enroll, yeah. people who are able to access this and participate in the system? Um, and um, have you had difficulty convincing participants of equipoise, this concept, and enrolling them in the trial? Yeah. So I think that's a good point that I think um, as the U.S. epidemic has changed, so initially it was, you know, among travelers who'd come back from Europe and Italy and stuff. And so sort of a very affluent population or healthcare workers who are very tech savvy and affluent as well, that those people you know, they to enroll and have access to the internet and, and to do that w was very easy. And as the the sort of U.S. epidemic has, has more shifted into lower income um, individuals that, um, you know, our, our, our enrollment has fallen off a little bit and um, the, and our uh, case mix has, has, has uh, changed a little bit where we have fewer healthcare workers, more household contacts. And so it's interesting that, um, yeah, that that it has changed a little bit, and then I think that the problem of equipoise has been has definitely come up, and so I think that's been sort of with all the media and all the hype and all the hysteria around this. You know, I think I said on Twitter the other day that basically half the people think that the trial is unethical because hydroxychloroquine clearly works, and the other half thinks it's unethical because it's clearly dangerous and shouldn't be done. And so, so it's sort of like people have really sort of strong opinions um, on this, and so that's I think interfered with people actually wanting to be in a randomized trial that. It's either dangerous or totally works, and, and it's sort of, I don't know, just crazy. Great. Thank, thanks, David, and thanks, Sean. Um, Mark, uh, you had a question for, for Mary Ann. Um, Great. Thank you very much. I'm taking the liberty of the last question, potentially. Um, Mary Ann, thank you for your data that comes up uh, 
uh, every week. Um, just a quick question for my own sort of education. Uh, you present uh, appropriately the numbers of infections as well as the numbers of hospital admissions and ICU admissions we're seeing, which is something we don't get on a regular basis from our own health ministry from a national perspective. What gives you the better sense of burden of disease? The data from hospital admissions and ICUs or the actual new infection rate, the actual incident rate every day? Or is it really just you gleaning a bit of information from both? So, um, thanks, that's a great question and one that we grapple with too. I think, um, as we know, we are uh, most likely hugely undetecting, un under detecting cases through our testing because at the moment our testing criteria are based on symptomatic cases. That's our case definition in order to qualify for a test. And um, that means that we are not detecting any asymptomatic cases in the community and under detecting spread of asymptomatic cases. From our experiences of workplace screenings, um, where we've ended up testing entire workplaces based on identifying clusters, we have seen large numbers of cases in asymptomatics. So in terms of a hard outcome, I think our hospitalizations, our ICU admissions and our deaths are a much better indicator of uh, kind of what is going on in the community because that should be a constant proportion of all cases. And we don't really know what that number of all cases is. Thank you very much. Okay. I've just got one last question uh, for David. Um, I mean, if we look at, at the trials that you, your group is undertaking and that there, there are a lot of other trials occurring across the world and in the US, do you have a sense of when we will get uh, a definitive answer regarding the efficacy of, and safety for that matter, of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine for both prevention and treatment. How long is, is a definitive answer away? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I probably didn't explain this but well, but I think when you look at treatment of COVID, you have sort of early aspect and you have a late aspect in the hospital. And so the early aspect of prevention, early therapy, I think is where antiviral certainly will help. Once people are in the hospital, the ICU, then there's immune things going on. And so that's a much different population. And so, so what, what we show in, in the prevention standpoint um, may or may not actually relate to what happens in the hospital. So for us, um, you know, our goal is to really have answers within weeks for the post-exposure prophylaxis and for the treatment. So it might be later today. Um, you know, we may be stopped for futility. We may be stopped for benefit. Um, you know, so, so and ideally, yeah, within weeks um, or, or days or maybe hours. So, so we'll see. Um, I think the other, there's about six or seven different trials around the world that are going on. There's another uh, post-exposure prophylaxis trial in Barcelona, and that one is nearly fully enrolled, I, I understand. And so that, um, I think they might be a month away from having some results um, based on their, their endpoint. Um, and then there's a bunch of, like every day, there's something new in the U.S. that pops up. And so it's like all these really small trials, which are probably going to end up to be underpowered. And it's sort of unclear why they're doing sort of trials per se. Um, but um, yeah, so, so, but I don't know. So for us, uh, you know, our, our goal was the end of, by the end of April to have an answer. And so we'll see if it's the end of today. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks again, David. That was fantastic. And thanks to Marianne and, and the four panelists. You know, I hope one of the, the take home messages of this webinar is the, the importance of having high quality evidence to drive our response to the epidemic. Uh, both from an ep epidemiological aspect, but as David has reminded us in terms of prevention and treatment, I think in the first few weeks of the epidemic, there was this crazy rush to just do something. Um, and, you know, if we do something in the absence of evidence and give people medication that has potential uh, safety uh, concerns, we could be doing harm rather than good. And I think uh, one of the key messages is even in the face of a, a, a pandemic like this, we need to still have underpinning our, our clinical practice, a good evidence-based medicine and, and wait for definitive evidence to, to uh, guide our practice. And I think, you know, hopefully within the next few weeks, months, we will have uh, answers to some of the questions that can then uh, 
inform our, our, our practice. And um, you know, I hope that that's one of the messages that has come through today, that the importance of evidence-based medicine, even in the face of a pandemic. So thanks to everyone. Uh, just to say, we will be holding these uh, webinars uh, weekly. Um, and next week, we will uh, have a speaker addressing issues around the development of a vaccine uh, for SARS-CoV-2 um, and the pipeline working towards uh, the development of a vaccine. Um, so we'll send out more details of that during the week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everyone. And just to note that the website address for looking at previous recordings and this one was put up during the talk and is available online. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Graham. See you next week.